thanks for the kind introduction and uh, very happy to hear that Kafka is your favorite tool. Uh, so I'm Stefan, I'm working as a software engineer at Confluent and uh, today I'd like to talk about taming the cost of uh, Kafka workloads, Kafka uh, related applications in the cloud. Um, before we get started, let's take a brief look at the agenda. So I would start with a um, brief introduction, um, set the scope for today's talk, um, uh, discuss uh, what's, what's in scope and what's also out of scope uh, of this talk, um, set some context before we can discuss different means to uh, taming cost of Kafka workloads, um, like reducing uh, cross AZ traffic, which will be beneficial for optimizing or reducing uh, network cost, uh, compression, which is also beneficial for optimizing network cost, and lag-based uh, scaling of Kafka consumers, as well as potentially scaling um, Kafka consumers to zero. And in the end, I try to, um, to sum up uh, things, and hopefully you'll learn one or two things uh, from this talk. Um, when there's a question, I think you can ask them straight away or maybe save questions for the end. Uh, usually we save the questions okay, so for the So better end. save them, please. Um, thanks. All right, so let's get started. Um, so I think cloud computing is great. Um, I worked in an era where we didn't have access to the cloud. And today it feels like we have access to a seemingly unlimited capacity of compute resources. We can. We can spin up um, new compute resources at any time uh, within a few minutes. Maybe except GPUs, they are quite rare today, but everything else is, um, is quite available, I would say. We can elastically scale our applications depending on the current workload. We can scale them up, we can scale them down. Um, we don't have to buy um, large server farms, pay them upfront, and, um, well, uh, plan for peak loads, we can just elastically adapt. And also usage-based pricing is nice, uh, so um, we get built for only those resources, um, compute, network, etc., that we actually use. I don't know if anyone ever woke up to surprise invoice from cloud providers. Okay, S some did. Uh, it really happens. Uh, it can be a surprise, um, not a positive one. Um, and um, yeah, it looks like uh, pricing um, in the cloud is not trivial. So it can be challenging. Um, you get charged for resources that are for free off the cloud, or maybe for free within certain limits. So um, especially uh, network uh, is, I would say, uh, often a huge surprise. Uh, when it comes to cloud computing, um, um, also um, the need to distinguish or uh, differentiate between different kinds of networks, so whether it's um, network within the availability zone of your region, uh, cross AZ traffic, or maybe uh, traffic going or coming from the internet, um, plays an important role when it comes to, uh, to costs. Um, suddenly, you need to take care of, of hibernating, of um, pausing your applications, because if you don't need them, you um, should not uh, pay for them. Otherwise, uh, cloud uh, computing can become quite expensive. And also, um, estimating a cost is not a very trivial um, uh, job. So you have to consider, actually, a lot of different factors, different uh, cost drivers, and um, yeah, especially when it comes to, to um, estimating network cost, you need to get um, the workload pattern that you'll experience uh, quite right to get an um, accurate uh, cost estimate. So in this talk, I try to um, share a few best practices um, when it comes to running Kafka workloads, so like a Kafka Streams applications, uh, streams application, a simple consumers, producers, and variant, um, uh, various uh, uh, client languages, or maybe a Flink uh, application in the cloud. I'll share techniques to reduce and optimize uh, costs. Um, we'll focus a bit on applications that you deploy on Kubernetes, and focus on the developer side of things. 
So I'll not really focus on operating Kafka itself um, on the cloud or in the cloud, and also not on uh, operating any related technology like Kafka Connect. I think that's a different talk. Um, I hope you didn't come here for this. Um, I also not discuss managed versus self-managed Kafka. Again, different talk. And I try to not focus on any particular cloud platform to keep it as uh, neutral as, as possible. Uh, but still hoping uh, to give you as many um, learnings and, and takeaways as possible. Hope that sounds good. All right. Um, so across the first half of the talk, uh, we'll focus on a setup, a use case, where we have um, a Kafka application, and that could be, for instance, a Kafka Streams application uh, interacting with a multi-AZ Kafka cluster. That means a Kafka cluster that's running in multiple availability zones of a cloud region, and that's um, well running in these different availability zones, mainly for being highly available. So in case one of the avail availability zones um, goes offline, we still have a um, working uh, Kafka cluster um, ready. And before we discuss different uh, means to taming the cost, let's take a quick look at cost drivers for Kafka workloads, probably uh, any other application as well. So we have network cost. Um, Kafka workloads cause ingress and egress cost uh, traffic when consuming uh, records from Kafka topics or producing records to Kafka topics. And uh, it's quite important um, to note that cloud providers differentiate between different kinds of traffic. So they differentiate between, let's say, AZ local traffic and remote traffic going to a different availability zone of your cloud region or maybe a, a different region or the internet. Uh, we'll have compute as second cost driver. So um, Kafka workloads require compute resources to run. So let's assume we deploy them on Kubernetes. Then we'll mainly care about CPU and main memory resources. If we elastically scale up and down our application, these um, resources, uh, resources or the consumption of these resources uh, will fluctuate and um, well, go up and down depending on the current workload. And last but not least, we'll have storage. So if we have a stateful stream processing application, like maybe a stateful Kafka Streams application, uh, they probably also need um, uh, storage to, um, well, store uh, their, their state, uh, which could be, for instance, a local disk or maybe some object storage or other storage solutions. Um, in this talk, I'll mainly focus on network and compute. And especially network can be a huge uh, su surprise uh, when it comes to cloud computing. So um, let's take a look at a um, quick example. So we have a um, um, Kafka application here, which is uh, consuming data from a Kafka topic, doing something with the data, and producing um, data to another Kafka topic. And let's just assume. Um, that this application is um, uh, ha having or experiencing a throughput of 100 megabyte per second uh, to make the sole example as uh, easy, straightforward as possible. So it's consuming um, at a throughput of 100 megabyte per second and producing uh, data at a throughput of 100 megabyte per second. And um, if we um, recall this picture showing the multi-AZ Kafka cluster, and if we assume that uh, Kafka topics or partitions are more or less equally distributed across these different AZs, um, we'll have two thirds of the consume and produce uh, traffic going to a remote AZ. So it will not be um, uh, traffic going to the local AZ. And um, again, I'm not looking at a particular cloud provider, but I would say what we can typically see is that cross AZ traffic is not for free. So let's just assume it costs maybe one cent per gigabyte, uh, but um, intra or local AZ traffic is for free. And if we take a look at uh, the potential cost of this uh, example, uh, we can see that due to um, the large portion of cross AZ traffic, 
uh, it will cost us um, more than three thousand uh, dollars per month to just run this um, application. That is just network cost. So uh, it's completely ignoring compute or any other um, cost driver. So quite high, I would say, for a single application. Um, let's take a look at the first <coughs> um, well technique to taming network cost, which is let's reduce cross AZ traffic. Um, <coughs> I don't know how many of you have worked with Kafka before. Okay, most of you. Uh, I would still do a very brief, quick recap. So um, in Kafka, we have uh, topics. And these topics are organized in partitions. <coughs> uh, we use partitions mainly um, to be able to kind of uh, split uh, consuming and, and producing um, so that we can scale the performance of our applications or we can parallelize produce and consume requests. And we also have replication, which is mainly useful for availability. So. <coughs> Typically, I would say typical configuration is that we have a replication factor of, of three. Um, so um, each topic partition will be replicated across three different uh, Kafka brokers. And for each partition, one of the Kafka brokers will take over the role of a so-called leader and all other Kafka brokers maintaining a replica for this partition will become a follower. And by default, both consumers and producers interact with only the leader of each partition. So they don't like to talk to, to followers. And there's a feature in Kafka, which is around for quite some time. So it has been introduced in Kafka 2.4. So that's a while ago. And this is called follower fetching. And it allows consumers to read data, to fetch data from their closest replica. It <coughs> extends existing, the existing RackAware placement of partition replicas, which allows us to um, distribute um, replicas across different, for instance, AZs, and uh, leverages locality for reads. And uh, there are two configuration options to enable this. So there's a broker level configuration option uh, called broker.rack, which lets us set, in the case of a cloud, uh, the, the name of the AZ that the broker is running in. And the same is, or a similar thing is available for consumers. This configuration option is called client.rack, and that lets us set uh, the AZ where the client application, the Kafka application, the consumer is running in. And if we take a look at um, the example, we can see that we've kind of annotated or configured uh, the different uh, brokers with this uh, broker um, related configuration option, broker rec, and have filled it with the uh, artificial AZ name. And uh, on the application side, on the right side, we can see that we have set the config configuration option client.rack to the name of the AZ of the client application, which is AZ2 in this case. Um, so in this case, um, the application will try to work or to consume only from replicas that are setting or being operated in the same availability zone as the application is running in. And how does it work? It's actually not too complicated. Um, so there's a class called RackAware Replica Selector. It has only 50 lines. I actually considered for one or two minutes just putting the code here, but 50 lines feels too much for a slide. Um, so I just put some comments here. S um, but it's working as follows. So um, if the client has set this uh, client.rec configuration option, um, it's um, iterating through all online replicas and trying to find um, a, a broker or replica with a matching um, rec ID or a Z name, and then just picks um, the replica that is most caught up with the leader. <coughs> um, if not, it's returning the current leader 
and which will potentially cause cross AZ traffic. Also, if you don't set this uh, configuration option, which is uh, the default, um, it will just pick the leader of the partition. Right, let's take a look at cost again. Cost is important. Um, so if everything goes well, if replicas are always or have always caught up, we can um, reduce cross AZ traffic on the consumer side to, let's say, close to 0% and uh, save um, network cost for cross AZ traffic on the consumer side. Uh, we still have cost on the producer side. Um, let's take a look at um, potential pros and cons for follower fetching. Uh, so we can minimize costly cross SE traffic for consumers. We might actually be able to improve read latency because we're only um, reading from local or AZ local uh, brokers. Um, on the con side of things, um, I mentioned that we are not able to reduce cross SZ traffic for producers. So it's only working for consumers. And in some cases, we might maybe increase read latency for consumers in an AZ, where um, followers are kind of lagging behind uh, leaders a bit. OK, um, the second technique that I'd like to mention or discuss is compression. And that works for both produce and consume requests. Um, again, a quick recap. So producers can actually send records in batches um, to reduce I.O. ops. So that's the main intentional motivation be behind batching records. And we have two configuration options uh, to uh, influence or, or configure the batching. So there's a batch size configuration option, and that tells the producer, the producer application, um, to which kind of upper bound it should batch records. And once that is reached, it will send the produce request. And the second option is uh, linear MS, which sets the maximum amount of time that the producer should wait um, for the batch to fill up before it's sending the batch. And using these two configuration options, you can kind of um, trade-off or balance between uh, latency and, and throughput. And the great thing is that producers can actually compress these batches of records. And that's done via a configuration option called compression.type. There's actually also a topic-level configuration option uh, with the same name. Um, let's take a look at the uh, producer-level config option first, which is called compression.type. And that lets you define a compression algorithm that should be applied to batches before sending or producing them to a broker. And we have different options available. So the default one is none. So by default, producers don't compress data. And there are various um, compression algorithms that you can choose from. Um, well, if you set it to none, nothing will happen. Uh, the producer will not compress the batch. Um, if you set it to, for instance, um, Snappy or LZ4, um, the producer will compress records before sending them to the broker. Um, in general, compression works best for larger batches. That's why I also mentioned these two options with repeating patterns. So random data is, uh, doesn't work well. Um, also, if you, for instance, use encryption and try to compress encrypted data, that's also not really working well. Um, it depends a lot of, on your data, on the format that you use, uh, whether you use JSON or, or Avro. Um, it will have a huge impact on compression. Uh, I would say a, a good starting point is probably LZ4. That's like a safe default, but you should still benchmark um, compression ratios and also CPU consumption um, when playing with this. Um, with this uh, configuration option. Uh, typically, you probably achieve compression rates of around two to three, um, like a factor of two to three. Um, I've seen more, I've seen less. Um, there's also a topic level config called compression type, which lets you set the compression algorithm that should be applied by the broker. Um, 
And if you set that for the topic, it will also be used by consumers. Um, here, options are slightly different. So we have the option uncompressed, in which case, um, well, um, data are not, or records are not stored um, in a compressed way. We have the default option called producer, which is just retaining the compression algorithm um, used by the producer. And again, we have these four different compression algorithms that we can choose from. Um, if you set this option to producer, and that's the default, it will retain compression. If you set it to uncompressed, it will potentially uncompress data before storing them. If the producer has um, compressed data before producing them, and otherwise, you might risk potentially recompressing data on the broker before storing them. So in most cases, um, it's safe to use the default option, producer, and completely delegate the process of compressing data, of compressing records to the producer. Uh, let's take a look at the potential impact of compression assuming that we can compress data by a factor of three or network cost. Um, we already saved on the consumer side, a uh, safe cost on the con consumer side by applying follower fetching. Um, so let's take a look at only the producer uh, side, in which case um, we are able to um, reduce or shrink um, the traffic to a, a third of the, let's say, original traffic. Um, and by that, by combi combining compression with follower fetching, we're able to save a lot of network cost. Um, if we look at compression in general, we can see that we can reduce network traffic, by the way, for both producers and consumers. Um, we have seen that producers can compress data before sending them to, uh, to Kafka. Um, consumers will um, read compress data and uncompress the data kind of locally um, if the Kafka broker stores the data um, in a compressed way. Um, compression helps us to reduce storage requirements and uh, improves throughput because we can send, consume more data um, using the same, let's say, um, network capacity. On um, uh, the three get you downsides, well, um, Compression is not for free, so it increases CPU consumption, and oftentimes it's a kind of uh, trade-off between CPU consumption and, and saving network cost. Um, potentially might increase end-to-end -end latency, and yeah, it does not work well for all kinds of data, data, so encrypted data, random data, does not play well with compression. Okay, um, let's take a look at taming compute cost. Um, first, I'd like to take a look at lag-based scaling of consumers. So this is only um, related to consumers, not producers. And just a quick recap um, again. So in Kafka, we can scale consumers by the concept of a consumer group, which lets you parallelize consumers by launching multiple instances of the same application, having um, the same uh, group ID. And Kafka will take care of automatically balancing the workload between the different instances of that application. And um, one consumer can process one or multiple partitions of the same topic at the same time, while a single partition can be processed by only one consumer of a certain consumer group. And that being said, um, the number of partitions kind of limits um, the maximum or sets of the maximum degree of parallelism, so we can't have more consumers or, or um, can't have more instances in our consumer group than we have partitions. And in a perfect world, we'd have a flat workload pattern with a um, quite predictable constant uh, throughput. Uh, which would allow us to, to handle uh, or consume this throughput with, with a stable uh, consumer group size. So let's maybe assume we have a throughput of 100 megabyte per second. Uh, we know that each consumer can handle 10 megabyte per second. We have maybe 10 partitions, and then um, we're good with um, having a consumer group with 10 consumers. Um, unfortunately, um, the real world is not as 
um, predictable and, and easy. So we have applications like maybe click events from uh, websites that experience more traffic during the day than during nights. We have maybe sensor data from IoT devices, um, order data from uh, online shops um, that um, experience certain peak hours, but don't experience the same traffic or workload um, around uh, the clock all the time. So we see throughput going up and going down, probably um, fluctuating over time. And a good uh, metric to kind of uh, capture the, the current um, uh, workload or throughput is uh, the so-called consumer lag metric, which equals the number of records in a topic partition that have not yet been processed by the consumer group. And if this lag um, increases, we will see an increase um, in the end-to-end -end latency, processing latency. And that might also kind of uh, indicate that our application can't handle uh, the workload uh, that's coming from the producer. Uh, so it's maybe time to scale up the consumer and um, introduce additional consumers to the consumer group. And one tool to, to um, perform this uh, task uh, in, let's say, an elastic way on Kubernetes is KEDA, which stands for Kubernetes Event Driven Autoscaling and lets you scale different uh, Kubernetes resources like deployments, stateful sets, and jobs, uh, but also others like even uh, custom, resource, uh, custom resources. And it can scale these objects based on custom metrics like um, consumer legs and integrates with the existing uh, horizontal pod autoscaler API, uh, which is a Kubernetes native resource, but lets you scale um, your resources mainly on, on CPU and main memory. It supports custom metrics, um, but uh, Keda does a much better job at, um, well, scaling based on custom metrics like a consumer leg. So if the consumer lag of your Kafka application increases, Keda can feed this data into the uh, horizontal pod autoscaler API and trigger a scale up. Um, if the application has uh, catched up and if the throughput goes down again, that means the consumer lag um, is zero or close to zero. Um, the HPA, the horizontal pod autoscaler, can scale down the application. And you can configure this or set this up as a custom resource in Kubernetes. Uh, you can point it to um, an existing Kubernetes resource like a deployment. Um, can tell uh, Keter how often it ch should uh, check the metric. Um, in this case, the consumer lag. And um, when it should uh, trigger a scale up or a scale down. So in this case, uh, we're um, targeting um, an average consumer lag of 50. If it's uh, above that, um, it will trigger a scale up. And if it's staying uh, below that, it will trigger a scale down. So hopefully, um, using Keda, we are able to cope with this fluctuating workload in a better way and can elastically scale up and down our consumer group. Um, Another interesting use case is um, or means of scaling consumers to zero. And uh, that's mainly useful for use cases like mm, when you um, perform a daily bike load um, from maybe an external data uh, source and, and produce these data um, to a Kafka topic, maybe once per day or once per week. That's even worse. Um, or when you handle reporting data and so on. So you'll see. Um, data being produced at certain points in time, and in between there's nothing. So you don't want to run your application all the time. And the great thing about Ikeda is that, um, as opposed to the Kubernetes native uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, uh, it even supports uh, scaling uh, resources like a deployment to zero, and um, also allows you to um, set things like a um, cooldown period so you don't immediately scale uh, your application to zero um, if you um, or if Keda observes that the consumer lag equals zero. Um, well, and it could look like this. So um, once your uh, application has consumed all data, uh, Keda will scale the application to zero. And once Keda notices that uh, new data is arriving again, it uh, starts up your application again. 
All right, um, I think we're at time. Uh, I would sum up things quickly and would then be able to take your questions. Um, so in cloud computing, network cost is often surprisingly high. Uh, we could tame that with follower fetching. So we could configure consumers in a way where they um, prefer to, um, to fetch from, from local replicas, which minimizes or completely um, avoids cross SE traffic on the consumer side. We can apply compression to reduce um, the data that we need to send on both the consumer and producer side. We can um, scale Kafka applications on Kubernetes based on consumer legs, scale up and down. And um, yeah, if you're having uh, or dealing with use cases like reporting data, um, where you um, see data being produced at certain times and um, well observe, um, let's say, um, uh, times where uh, no data is being produced to your Kafka topic, consider also scaling to zero with a tool like Keda. And uh, well, thanks a lot. Or well, maybe I just show this slide. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to uh, take them, discuss Anybody? them. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, does the Keda Autoscaler also support little, let's say, more sophisticated triggers? Like, yeah, don't scale up or down right away, but if it stays, I don't know, like, like with alerts in Grafana, stays above 1 million for 10 minutes, then scale yeah, up. Yeah, you and can exactly also that, that. Also yeah. the other way around, like, don't scale down right away after it's below 1 million, but wait yeah. longer or something It, it like actually that. Uh, just integrates with the um, horizontal pod autoscaler kind of API. And yeah, you can um, distinguish or set these uh, things only for the scale up or, or scale down uh, job. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes I mean, um, you also um, maybe s see like a flapping behavior, so you don't want to scale up and scale down uh, your resources all the time, especially not a Kafka application, which is a bit sensitive um, when it comes to, for instance, uh, consumer rebalancing. You don't want uh, this to happen all the time. So yeah, there are things to avoid this. Anybody else? Thank you. Quick question. Um, not sure how relevant that is, but so have you tried modifying the VM and kernel settings, not only the Kafka settings, so stuff like uh, dirty uh, read, uh, dirty ratios and, uh, you know, for larger loads setting um, uh, large I.O. So and if you have, have you noticed any performance or cost improvement? Um, would that, um, I mean, for which purpose mainly? Are you, are you considering that? So, <clears throat> basically, um, <laughs> thank you very much. So, one of the things that I've, uh, I'm trying to do out of research was that um, for Kafka brokers, mm -hmm. you should be, uh, well, first of all, it should be the only thing that's uh, being hosted on the machine. And if you uh, really want to squeeze the most out of that uh, Kafka basically broker, um, a good advice is to play around with the kernel settings. So, you know, uh, to modify the, as I said, the dirty ratio um, and all of those things. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what my question is about. If there's any benefit at to, all of to, doing to that. To achieve a better performance. Better performance in and general. if it actually yields um, maybe uh, less cost. Yeah. Um, I have not played with that, uh, to be honest. Um, it sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so. Um, I would appreciate it if you could share findings. Thanks. Anyone else? No? Uh, maybe a bit uh, too technical, but about the, uh, the batch size, is that per partition or per broker that the producer actually talks to? Um, and it's do actually I have to per like partition multiply because, by um, partition? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So. Um, Partitions of the same topic can potentially uh, kind of live or, or um, be stored on different brokers. Um, so batch size is affecting um, 
a um, request to a single partition. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's per partition. I mean, I could have three partitions on the same broker and three on others. So the request is per partition. Yeah. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you.